I saw an interesting interview on Hot 97's The Breakfast Club the other day. A controversial interview in which the, uh, I'm not even sure exactly what to call him, black nationalist activist. Apparently there's some doubt as to whether he actually is a legitimate scholar, Dr. Umar Johnson. He actually gave an interview not his first, on The Breakfast Club, in which, among other things, he inveighed against interracial marriage, saying that black men in particular, when they marry white women, it's usually because they secretly deep down wish they were white, or they're trying to achieve greater status by counting the white man's prize, the white woman, amongst their conquests, their achievements, blah, 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 blah. He actually participated in an interview and panel discussion with TV One's Roland Martin, formerly of CNN, in which he expanded on some of these ideas and got into a bit of a shouting match with the other panelists. I decided I wanted to comment on this controversy because it provides me with an opportunity to expand on some ideas and beliefs of my own. Believe it or not, I actually sympathize with more than a little of what Dr. Johnson has to say. For starters, let me just say up front, I have a lot of issues with him, doubts about him, reservations about him and what he represents. I'm not going to go into all the details about his past and his credentials. Instead, I've included some links underneath this video for you all to consult at your leisure. I highly recommend that you do so because it's important that we approach these kinds of conversations from a factual standpoint. When it comes to facts, unfortunately, Dr. Johnson doesn't always have his straight. I can attest to this personally, just having watched and listened to a lot of his public presentations. For example, in his most recent Hot 97 interview, he made a lot of claims that even I, just off the top of my head, could identify as either dubious at best or completely false at worst. This was a very wide-ranging discussion, so he made a lot of claims in a lot of different areas. For example, he claimed that Fidel Castro was actually Italian. In reality, Fidel Castro's father was from Spain, not Italy. Dr. Johnson claimed that um, the name Buddha, because he was talking about the supposed black foundations and origins of Buddhism and so on, and various ethnic groups outside of Africa, such as in South and East Asia, he claimed that the name Buddha means the black face. As you'll see in one of the sources that I include underneath this video, apparently that's not true either. He claimed that Mandarin is now being introduced as an official language in South Africa. In his later interview with Roland Martin at TV One, he clarified that he meant that it's an official language in South Africa's public schools. Apparently, in reality, while Mandarin is an option, it's a language that can be taught and is being taught to some extent in at least some public schools in South Africa. I don't think it makes sense or that it's accurate to call it an official language because that makes it sound as if South African public school children are being required to learn Mandarin in school, and apparently that's not the case. And of course, as he conceded in discussion with Roland Martin, Mandarin is not an official language in South Africa overall. It makes sense that it wouldn't be. In other past interviews that I've seen Dr. Johnson make, he's also made some other claims that are, again, highly suspect or flat out false. In an earlier conversation with the folks at the Breakfast Club, I think he claimed that Barack Obama did more for the gay community during his presidency than he did for African Americans. I think he claimed that the achievement of same-sex marriage is really Barack Obama's doing. That's not really true. It was the doing of pro-gay rights activists who filed lawsuits in courts that wound their way up to the Supreme Court, giving the Supreme Court the opportunity to make its decision in Obergefell versus Hughes a couple of years ago, requiring the recognition of same-sex marriages across the land. Can't really give Obama the credit or the blame for that, depending on how you look at it. Of course, I say credit because I believe in marriage equality. This whole idea that Obama's done more for gay people than for black folks is absurd. For Dr. Johnson to try to pit the two groups against each other is very, very wrong. A lot of the comments he's made about issues such as gay rights or homosexuality really do smack of homophobia, and I'm not here for that at all. That really brings me to my next point about Dr. Johnson and a lot of others who think and speak the way he does. I've heard their brand of black nationalism referred to recently as the onk right. Now an onk is this symbol that I'm wearing on my pendant right now. From what I understand, it's an ancient Egyptian symbol of life. And it's been adopted as a symbol by a lot of folks in the black community as a symbol of black pride and black solidarity. That's why I wear these onks. You guys, I'm, I'm sure have seen me wearing them in a lot of my videos up to this point. Now you know why. Another word for that whole school of thought or attitude, I think it's probably more attitudinal than intellectual, quite frankly. Another term for it that I've seen used recently is hotep. 
it's really gotten a bad name in recent years among folks in the progressive movement, et cetera, et cetera, including the black intelligentsia. Again, with good reason. It tends to carry a lot of baggage when it comes to issues such as women's rights and gay rights. There's often a latent misogyny that you hear in a lot of these attitudes expressed by hotep folks and, of course, a barely concealed hostility to gay folks. And, of course, to white folks as well, as well as to phenomena and practices like interracial marriage. I'm not here for any of that, for all the obvious reasons. I will say this, though, and this is where I really get into a part of this discussion that might become difficult for some viewers, where I actually think that there is some value and some merit in some of what people like Dr. Johnson have to say. When it comes to his hostility to interracial relationships and interracial marriage, I don't share it at all. I don't think there's anything wrong with interracial relationships. I've dated outside of my own race. I don't think I did anything wrong in doing so. And I don't think there's anything wrong with black men or black women, for that matter, who do so. By the same token, however, I do think that it's important that we understand where black folks who do oppose interracial relationships are coming from. For centuries, for most of our history in this hemisphere, not just in America, but in the entire Western Hemisphere, Africans and African descendants have been sent a message, sometimes blatant, sometimes latent, that we are inferior to whites, inferior to other races, and unattractive on a physical level. That African features, quote-unquote, nappy hair, dark skin, broad, rounded noses, and thick lips are just not attractive features, particularly on women. Now, those Eurocentric standards of beauty and the demoralizing and dehumanizing impact that it's had on black folk psychology has, of course, engendered a pushback. You could call it a, a blacklash of sorts within the black community, within the African diaspora. Many of us want to push back against those ideas that communicate to us that we are less attractive and less worthy as human beings than our white or other counterparts. That's, for example, where James Brown's famous chant and song, Say It Loud, I'm Black and I'm Proud, originated. Frankly, I sympathize a great deal with that sentiment. I do think it makes sense for us to push back against the idea that we are less than attractive. I understand where Black folks in general, and Black women in particular, are coming from when they feel a pang at the sight of maybe an interracial couple, particularly if it's a Black man with a white woman. A thought often crosses many black folks, and again, particularly black women's minds, that when you see a black man with a white woman or any non-black woman, it must be because he's self-hating. He's ashamed of his own blackness or he aspires to be white, etc., etc. At the same time, it's important not to take that sentiment too far. First of all, at the end of the day, individuals have the right to live their lives as they see fit. Let's just get that out of the way. As a libertarian, you know, I'm a strong believer in living and letting live, yes? For another thing, at the end of the day, love is love, and it's very difficult for people to control whom they fall in love with, if not impossible. At the end of the day, we are still all members of the human species, one larger human family. And however much pride we take in our particular cultural origins, it's important for us not to lose sight of that fact. We are all God's children. And for that reason alone, I think that if a black person falls in love with a white person, we shouldn't give that black person a hard time. We shouldn't have a hard time respecting that black person, as Dr. Johnson said that he would in his interview with Roland Martin. He said he would have a hard time respecting a black man who married a white woman, even if that black man had done a great deal to benefit the black community. I disagree with that sentiment altogether. We are still members of the same human family, and when it comes to culture, I think I may have mentioned this in a past YouTube video or two, at the end of the day, each person, in my view, should be akin to a tree. A tree needs both roots and branches in order to survive. I think the same ought to go for human beings. We should stay close to our roots and preserve our cultural heritages to the extent that we want to do so and are willing to put in the work that's required by the same token, we should also be able to branch out and interact with people of different cultures and mix with people of different cultures. If that means you fall in love with someone from a different background, that's not something for which people should be given a hard time. Going to a Jewish law school really opened my eyes to a lot of different facets of this whole issue. The black community is not the only historically marginalized, oppressed, and persecuted group, some members of whom believe that members of the group should marry within the group itself. I knew a lot of Jewish schoolmates of mine who were pressured by their parents to marry Jewish. Now, in that case, there's a religious dimension to it as well, obviously, but there's a cultural and ethnic ancestral dimension, just like there is such a dimension to Jewish identity in general. 
frankly, when you consider the size of Jewish populations in the Jewish diaspora and in Israel, I don't blame members of the Jewish community who look somewhat askance at the phenomenon of Jews marrying non-Jews. I would never go so far as to inject myself into that debate within the Jewish community and take a side and try to tell members of the Jewish community which side they ought to take, but to the extent that I take an idle intellectual interest in it, it does fascinate me given the parallels between that and the black experience. But at the same time, at the end of the day, people are going to love who they love, and I think it makes more sense for us as black folks to find ways to accommodate interracial relationships within our larger experience. Most of us, due to a history of not only voluntary racial intermingling, but also rape of female slaves by their white male enslavers, most of us in the African diaspora do have mixed racial ancestry to one degree or another anyway. From what I've read, your average African-American, for example, has something like 20% European ancestry. Many of us have some white in us, some East or South Asian ancestry in our family trees. That's probably the case with me since my family comes from Trinidad and Tobago, a country where blacks are not even a plurality of the population, let alone a majority. Some of us have indigenous blood in our family trees, etc., etc. It's too late to try to keep our race pure or what have you. Even if it weren't too late, it would be wrong to go that far. I think it would make more sense for us as a community to focus on raising biracial children who have black ancestry with a familiarity of the African side of their family trees so that they are familiar with their African roots and that they're not ashamed of them. To try to shame black folks who marry outside of the race, who have kids outside of the race, it's not practical and it's not right. Another general stance that Dr. Johnson and others like him have taken, this is an area where I have a lot more sympathy. One thing that Umar Johnson mentioned in his interview with Roland Martin was that he believed in starting private, independent, Black-owned and Black-run schools. I think Roland Martin said, well, you can start a charter school. That's an option. Dr. Johnson replied, no, charter schools are still ultimately chartered by the government, by the state. He said, I'm a Pan-Africanist. I believe that that which needs to be done for Black people should be done by Black people. I actually agree with that general principle very strongly. I believe very strongly in maximum black independence. I believe in reducing the African diaspora's dependence on government assistance in particular and the assistance of folks outside of the community in general. Not because I think there's anything morally wrong with folks outside the black community working with us in solidarity and an alliance to try to advance our interests, but because I do believe that as a community, it's a virtue for us to be able to stand on our own two feet to the greatest extent possible. That's one of the reasons why I'm a libertarian. I would like to see a situation in my lifetime before I shuffle off this mortal coil in which my people, my community, the African diaspora is no longer seen as white folks' collective charity case, quite frankly. That attitude, frankly, stems as much from my own particular brand of black nationalism as it stems from my libertarian views. I don't think there's any contradiction between the two. I believe that there are forms of nationalism that can be made consistent and compatible with small government or limited government principles and the ideas of liberty. The key is that it be a form of nationalism that does not involve statism. The key is that it be based on voluntary cooperation at the grassroots level between members of a given cultural community or a given nation. And I believe that the African diaspora in general and specific branches of it, such as the African American population, do constitute nations. I would say Black America is a nation within a nation. I think I mentioned that in at least one of my past YouTube videos. I would like to see the preservation of and the building of viable black community institutions that can not only preserve our heritage and our distinct identity and promote that identity, quite frankly, to all peoples of all backgrounds, but also enable us to uplift ourselves socioeconomically and to achieve prosperity. A lot of folks might have a problem with that, but one discovery that I made about nine years ago when I was just about to graduate from college really convinced me that uh, there's no contradiction between that particular form of non-statist nationalism and libertarian ideas and principles. I was actually reading a book called The Conservative Intellectual Movement Since 1945 for a course that I took on conservative political thought during my last semester of college at Princeton. And I remember reading a section that talked about how 50 years ago, back in the late 1960s, at the height of the Black Power Movement, there were actually conservative pundits who were endorsing certain aspects of black nationalism or certain brands of black nationalism. They were saying, here you have some brands of black nationalism that aim to make black America less dependent on government largesse, less dependent on welfare, less dependent on policies like affirmative action, which at that time was just slowly but surely taking shape, etc., etc. 
They uh, cited a book called Beyond the Melting Pot, which was co-written by Nathan Glazer and I think Daniel Patrick Mornian back in the 60s that said, if you look at the history of immigrant groups in America, the ones that rose were the ones that maintained a very strong sense of identity and a great deal of solidarity, especially on an economic level, amongst themselves. They shopped amongst each other. They did business with each other. They formed strong community institutions that helped uplift the less fortunate among them, etc., etc. And I found it very revealing that you here you had these white conservative commentators who were actually endorsing certain forms of black nationalism. And so that made me think, you know, it's interesting where you can find support for the idea of black nationalism or black solidarity in the funniest or seemingly unlikeliest places. Now, I believed in that kind of black solidarity already before I encountered those sources, but that's what really convinced me that I could embrace a certain brand of black nationalism without giving up my libertarian bona fides, which I was even then only beginning to adopt. So these are the things that come to my mind when I hear people like Umar Johnson speak. I think the tragedy of people like him is they often rely on pseudoscience and pseudo-history to come up with their conclusions and their claims. A lot of the assertions they make turn out to be false. Their scholarship, such as it is, is often shoddy and unreliable. And sometimes they really turn out to be, you know, straight up snake oil salesmen. It's too bad because I do think that, like a lot of other long-suffering, long-oppressed communities, the black community has suffered from its fair share of false prophets. It's entirely possible that Umar Johnson is, to some degree, one of those false prophets. But at the same time, I do think some of what he has to say has merit. When he talks about founding black-owned and black-operated schools, I'm all for it as long as it's done a certain way. My understanding is that he raised hundreds of thousands of dollars, partly through online crowdsourcing, to uh, start a black school out of the ashes of a historically black high school that was closed down several years ago. And the money hasn't really gone anywhere so far. He hasn't been able to account for how it was spent. Now that kind of thing is shady. But the general principle, I don't have a problem with. I think there are a number of ways that kind of thing can go wrong. But frankly, I think there are a lot of ways it can also go right. It's too bad that that kind of cause is coming in a vessel as flawed as Dr. Umar Johnson, given the, a lot of the flaws in his methodology and a lot of the less savory beliefs that he espouses, such as his homophobia or his apparent, even one could say, latent misogyny or sexism. I have very mixed feelings about the likes of Dr. Umar Johnson. When it comes to style, I like his style a lot. I think he's a terrific speaker. He's very articulate, very smooth, very charismatic very good at getting his message across in a way that's appealing. It's too bad that the substance of his views is so riddled with errors and problematic attitudes, even outright prejudices. I do think we need to resist that. But even a broken clock is right twice a day. And as broken as Dr. Johnson's clock may be, I do think he is right twice a day. I agree with him when he says we need more black solidarity of a certain kind in order to uplift the race. I, too, would like to see us become less dependent on white folks' charity, quite frankly, to put it, you know, <laughs> less than charitably, I suppose. I do look forward to the day when we as a community can achieve that. Frankly, I plan to add my own energies to those efforts. I just think it's very important that we... You know how they say don't throw out the baby with the bathwater? I think it's important to make sure we throw out the bathwater and not keep the bathwater in our efforts to... Hold on to the bait.